started seeing that, that the local field potentials that uh, neurophysiology was physiologists recorded and then didn't ignore it mainly. They just used it to extract the spike count. Um, that there was a, there's a lot of interesting interplay between local fields and spikes in cortex. So those two subfields have become more, are gradually becoming more unified. That leaves the gap between EEG and local field potentials, and that's something that, uh, for which ground truth, truth doesn't yet fully exist, and something that I'll talk about. So it's possible that there will be a field of brain electrophysiology uh, in the sense that uh, people, uh, many researchers contributing to it directly and talking to each other, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, and, and that would be good. Okay, EEG lab. So here we are. Um, this was uh, after some original discoveries and developments on my part. Um, I uh, began putting, uh, people didn't understand, in the EEG studies, didn't understand what I was talking about when I talked about all this ICA. So I said, well, to myself, I said, well, I'll put the, the functions that I've written for myself on the, on the web, and they, or their students, can uh, play with them and, and maybe understand a little more. I mean, that's literally what happened. So in uh, 97, he put a toolbox of those MATLAB functions on the web, and uh, including new kinds of plotting of single trials and trial by trial differences and so on. And then Arno came along and had some computer science, he had his master's in computer science. And so he said, well, I can put a GUI on it. And uh, in fact, he said, I, I already did. So uh, <laughs> that was the beginning of, of, uh, of EEG Lab. And I think the, its history is, is one of its strengths. The, the main focus was originally, and, and still can be, on the individual functions by which you can write, I uh, can use all the power of MATLAB to write very flexible analysis scripts. And uh, at the same time, the, the GUI gives uh, ability to explore new data very easily and very powerfully. And also it provides, through its history mechanism, it provides a, a route to learning how to write MATLAB scripts because you can, you can recover what the, what the interface actually issued, the commands that the interface actually issued to, to MATLAB and then use those as the basis of your first scripts and functions. So we released the EG Lab as the first you know, version one in 2002. And from 2004, we've had support from NIH under a program for existing, already existing biomedical software. Um, we added, we continue to add a lot. Arno added the idea of plugins, that, it, that if you write a, t a tiny function, your function can now appear in the, in the EG Lab menu of anyone who has it. Uh, there's something like 50 plugins that are now available through the plugin manager, or the extension manager, as it's called. We started looking at uh, clustering across subjects, and now Arno is going to uh, announce and introduce a, uh, a much more elaborate system for doing statistics across uh, subjects, conditions, uh, sessions, and so on. Uh, we've had people in the lab who've done very significant and sophisticated toolboxes for forward in inverse modeling, uh, information flow, BCI, and so on. And uh, these, are, these are functioning as plugins to EEG Lab. Uh, some survey um, of cognitive neuroscientists found that EEG Lab was actually the most used environment for EEG signal processing. And we've also been uh, developing software for doing mobile brain body imaging, essentially for doing multimodal EEG research. So e e recording EEG, for instance, and eye movements, recording and analyzing EEG, eye movements, and body motion capture, and force plate body sway, and video, and audio. And so we've been introducing tools. I, uh, here I called it uh, Erica. Uh, 
But there is a separate set of tools that are available uh, for that, and there'll be a session at the last day on that. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's in connection with our effort to develop simultaneous uh, high bandwidth EEG and uh, behavioral measures. And then we have the beginnings of a database. And we have the beginnings, actually, of a system for annotating events in a way that you, both humans and computers can read, so that your events that you noted in your experiments are now, only, now not event 13, where you have to look up, or someone has to, who wants to use the data has to look up and say, what in the hell is event 13? Um, but they, they're now, now going to be annotated with a uh, descriptive and elaborate possibly elaborate strings, and uh, our colleague Kay Robbins in, in uh, San Antonio is, and her students are building uh, tools for, for adding those annotations to your data or actually putting them into your capture of your data, and the, there'll be a session on that uh, later on. So. Um, we've had these workshops. Oh, this is a picture. This was a picture I took off the web of where people had logged into the EEG data set, uh, uh, website in a 24-hour period. And so the scientific world is pretty well represented there. You see India. You see China and Beijing. You see, of course, Europe, the U.S., Canada, South America, Australia, Indonesia. And in fact, we've been called on to give workshops uh, all over the world. Um, Sheffield was last year. Italy was this last summer. La Jolla is this workshop. And we're going to be in India, uh, Japan, and Israel, and France again next year. So these, these, are, these are invitations usually by local hosts who organize the meeting. And we just come with our with presentations. Now, all that, I, that we're showing and I'll show uh, was not made just by me. It was, uh, there's been lots of people working with us at the Swartz Center over the years. These are just some of them. In fact, they were the people who happened to be there when we realized it was the 10th anniversary of the Swartz Center and went out and got some food and called it and had a tea party. I had to add some other visitors. And we've had a numbers of visitors bringing data uh, from Europe, from Asia, and uh, currently there's a uh, project from Japan called Brain Circulation, which means their brains circulate to UCSD, and our brains circulate to Japan. Um, and so we've, it, this, all that we'll, I'll show have been highly enriched by the participation of not only people in the lab, but by all the people contributing bug reports uh, improvements, suggestions, and new plugins and tools to EG Lab. So these are some of the ones that we've put together. And uh, you can see all of them at, on the extension page, of course. And download, and, uh, and then there's a push mechanism to alert you when, if you have a, if you've downloaded one of these, and uh, there's a new version, it will tell you and allow you to easily keep up to date. OK, so now, that's the EEG lab picture. Now let's go to the big picture. The biggest picture is, uh, well, this, I think, is the biggest picture. You know, it's the fundamental question of human life. Well, we have the capability to ponder such questions. And uh, of course, there's many, there's many uh, ways of going about addressing this. One thinks of philosophy, religion, mysticism, uh, experience. Uh, and science. And so uh, I, I think of myself as a cognitive neuroscientist interested in this question of, uh, in a, in, of making this kind of question concrete to answer, to ask questions about how does my brain and nervous system support my experience and my behavior, or our experience and our behaviors. So I, here's my prose poem about cognitive neuroscience and call it embodied agency, which I believe is sort of the fundamental of, of ordinary human consciousness, is we feel we are embodied 
agents that can affect changes in our environment and affect other agents that we find in the environment. So what do brains do? Brain processes have evolved and functioned to optimize the outcomes of the behavior the brain organizes in response to perceived challenges and opportunities. Brains meet the challenge of the moment, every moment. There's a continual cycle of perception, action, evaluation of the results of action. These loops are going on continually in our brain, not as physical loops necessarily, but as uh, system lo loops. And, uh, and because of the difficulty, uh, the, okay, so, so to understand how the brain works, then, when you need to look at how does the brain uh, organize behavior, of course, but, how, but optimizing behavior is different than organizing it. So what are the perceived, how does the brain perceive challenges and opportunities, and here we're first thinking of reward and threat. Uh, on that axis. And so wh what challenges and opportunities do our brains perceive? Not, obviously not all of them. We can do, but the brain has developed subsystems that are very acutely uh, are sensitive to these. And then how does that get translated into action plans? And then how is the cycle of, of awareness uh, continue to, to uh, evolve and change every moment? Because our, our, our environment and our goals and our out, the outcomes we're aware of are so diffuse, so um, manifold that brain dynamics need to change every moment. And that is the fundamental problem and challenge for signal processing of brain activity. And it's made more acute by the fact that EG has the temporal resolution of our thought and our actions itself themselves. So I, I think there, uh, um, there's, no, there's no chance that the, uh, <clears throat> all questions about brain dynamics, even at the level of uh, how, what information can we derive from the scalp EEG, that all, these, all, all such questions will be answered anytime soon. There will be a lot of exciting progress that will be made and is being made. <clears throat> So EEG gives us the opportunity to image human agency, uh, and it's an exciting, it's an exciting opportunity. It requires the coming together of uh, computation, uh, sense, sensing, and uh, uh, and mathematics, as well as uh, bringing in developments from neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, psychiatry, etc. So, but what is the EEG that we can record from the scalp? I, I use this picture of a sculptor, Smilde, who makes a cloud in the, in the gallery. That's his sculpture. And I use it as a good ana uh, analogy to EEG because people doing EEG have sort of felt for you know, all these 90 years, well, EEG is electricity that's in there somewhere. It's sort of a cloud. You know. And it comes out, leaks out into the. Well, we know that EEG represents what comes out on the scalp is represents only a small portion of uh, brain electrical activity, dominated by cortical currents and, of course, non-brain arti uh, artifact processes. And an even smaller portion then of total brain electrical activity. But the questions are: which portion is it? How is it triggered? How is it modulated? And what, with what functional significance? Does it itself have a function? Or is it so linked to changes in brain function that we can use it? How, how well can we use it to monitor and observe changes in cognitive state and physiological state in, uh, in subjects Experience, changes in experience, response to events, and intentions. 
The fundamental problem in my mind with uh, studying brain dynamics that's completely different than studying you know, how this machine works or that machine works is that brain dynamics are inherently and profoundly multi-scale. And in fact, each signal that one records, and let's think of electrophysiology here, each electrophysiological signal one records, taking two electrodes and measuring the difference between them, is actually a signal produced by active partial coherence and summation of distributed activities at the next smaller spatial scale. So the signal that you record is not a, a single signal, actually. It represents a summation of, of distinct uh, signals. So if you recorded from the bouton of a, new, a neuron, your, your signal would be represent the summation and, and coherence in time and space of molecular events, synaptic events. If you recorded from inside a neuron, you're recording the, the, the field changes, that, uh, potential changes you would record are produ represent changes in the, in the temporal and spatial coherence of synaptic events on the up to 5,000 synapses on a, on a pyramidal cell and non-synaptic uh, influences. If you record outside the cell, you're recording the, the, the summation of, of field phenomena in, in local, of surrounding neurons in, in the local neighborhood. And with larger and larger electrodes, farther and farther away from the, from the brain itself, one can only record events that represent the coherence in time and space of local field activities, now coming from all over the cortex in the case of EEG. So the brain dynamics are inherently multi-scale in a way that none of our technology is. Recently, it's been shown that this, this uh, coupling between scales is bidirectional. In other words, the larger scale fields have an influence on smaller scale, scale phenomena. In particular, this paper, which, didn't, which wasn't an EEG paper, it was a rat paper, by Flavio Frillich, showed where they induced field potentials into the brains of animals and, and then measured the uh, neural spiking. And what they found was that at, at naturally occurring EEG current densities, there wasn't necessarily a change in firing rate of the neurons, but there was a change in the degree to which they fired synchronously. And why is that important? Because synchronous firings of neurons in any common target represent uh, highly potentiate or highly uh, increase the power of that signal going forward to have make effects at target neurons, either to create uh, prompt spikes in those neurons and sending that event further on, and then at the same time, through short and long-term plasticity mechanisms, affecting brain learning and plasticity. So local fields, by this paper and other papers recently, actually have effects both at the next smaller scale level in terms of spike timing, and through that potentially into large scale organization and network dynamics of the brain. So I argue that, that what we see in scalp EEG is, uh, uh, and in fact at any spatial scale where we record electrical signals in the brain, are macro field dynamics that are the sum of organized, uh, uh, spontaneously emerging organized activity in a nonlinear medium. And here's, here's such a medium, uh, outer space, and here's spontaneously organized activity, a galaxy. Um, it was Walter Freeman, a pioneer, who uh, had an MD and an uh, uh, engineering degree, who began recording from the smooth cortex of animals a, uh, on an 8 by 8 grid of electrodes in the 70s already um, on smooth cortex. And he was studying uh, the sniffing by uh, rabbits. 
uh, of new orders. And, and he would record this array, and he would look at the spatial temporal dynamics, particularly at uh, high frequencies. There'd be a high frequency burst uh, around 40 hertz at every sniff. And he noticed that sometimes they would become organized into, uh, uh, they would become phase coherent with a spatial temporal dynamic that he likened to a pond ripple. He called this phase cone. Uh, this was later studied, uh, I believe, by Plentz and Beggs and others in using the uh, term avalanches, circular avalanche events. Now, this is the kind of cooperative, the phase alignment that can produce far field potentials that one can potentially record as far away as the scalp. Here is Beggs and Plentz. They noted these, that these phenomena uh, had different sizes. Uh, in, the, in the cortex, and the scaling law that uh, governed uh, their, uh, that organized, by which their distribution of sizes was organized, fit into the concept of the, the nonlinear dynamic concept of avalanche events. So, local cortical synchronies, I believe, are the effective EEG sources that dominate the scalp signal. Here is a, uh, a animation, a simulation of cortex, a simple simulation of cortex by Stan Anderson and uh, Johns Hopkins, um, showing that these sort of pond ripple effects uh, can easily occur in cortex. Of course, these were nonlinear differential equations that in which there are lots of parameters, and you can tune the parameters to get all sorts of different things, and they, they managed to get something that looked like what they see in, um, in grit, animal cortical grit, small-scale small cortical grit. This is meant to be only a few millimeters across. Here is a, a paper from last year in which they, uh, the authors uh, used animals, I can't remember which, um, had them anesthetized, and therefore they only had slow EEG activity, and studied the spatial temporal dynamics of it. And they, they noted again these, you see these, uh, that's, uh, those are arrows that are, that are facing out, so that's the pond ripple. Sometimes they would, as Walter Freeman did, see the pond rippling, rippling inward. And then they found more interesting topological things like spiral waves. And uh, here's a saddle bifurcation. What they found was that the first patterns in these anesthetized animals were associated with um, higher amplitude because, of course, I, uh, these signals would add up since they, the, the phases were almost synchronous across an array. And, uh, but in these more complex patterns, uh, they found more um, higher spike rates, actually. So there's, a, there's again, a, a mixing of spatial scales in these complex dynamics of, of the cortex. Here is some optical dye applied to a rat. Now this is, again, is, you know, uh, the size of my little fingernail or smaller. Um, and these are some spontaneous activity. Now is, is the, and here's a picture of nonlinear dynamic uh, spatial temporal phenomena. It's a, it should be a frame from a movie showing the roiling of the surface of the sun. It was taken by this backyard telescope. NASA called him up and said, how, how did you get that? And he said, well, I'm a physicist, so I knew exactly the, the color that was a line that filtered for the line in, in the hydrogen spectrum. And so I just had the camera face the sun and uh, I got this beautiful picture. So what it shows is uh, that these dynamics, which I imagine in this picture, you know, the, the colored changes represent uh, probably temperature changes, <coughs> I would imagine. But what you see is the, uh, the spatial structure on multiple spatial scales. You see a large sunspot there, and you see spatial structures at other scales. And I'm sure if you were able to zoom in uh, at the next smaller scale, you would also see structures. So does such a picture exist for cortex? And the answer is no. Uh, 
Um, because of the, the single-minded focus on the microelectrode and the single neuron, which is thought of as a you know, little guy speaking in there, um, and then the, the goal of reconstructing how brain dynamics work by studying neuron by neuron, which is now expanded to studying multiple neurons, uh, spike rates of multiple neurons, or spike humors, each thought of as a point process, not as a part of a spatial temporal field. Uh, because of that, the, the neuropheal neurophysiology wasn't really pushing for it. And then, of course, there were, you know, if you're going to have, uh, this is a, a million voxels, uh, a million channel system to record ECOG with is uh, difficult. However, in the brain programs that are d developing around the world, uh, the higher and higher density uh, cortical recordings are coming in. And so I think we'll learn in the next several years much more about this link between EEG and uh, local field dynamics and of, and of the functional significance of local field synchronies. This is a picture of the sun that points out that if you record at different wavelengths, different colors, different frequencies, different light frequencies, you see different spatial structure. This is just a montage, and, uh, <coughs> and that's certainly uh, likely to be true of uh, for the cortex as well. Wilson, I think, uh, coined this term scale chauvinism, whereas, you know, we spike guys know the brain runs on spikes, and we EG people know that it all is the waves, and, uh, and the synapse people say, no, it's the molecular events, and then, of course, the quark physicists are over there saying, well, it's all quarks, you know. So, um, and, it, and that's a real sociological phenomenon. I, I was at a workshop convened, uh, convened particularly for the purpose of looking at brain dynamics on multiple scales, and nothing was said. Everyone talked about their scale. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of the workshop, we had the post-dinner discussion. <clears throat> and I put up the picture of, you know, different scales. And I said, well, what, what about this problem? We're not, we're, everyone's talking about their own level, and no one's talking cross level. And one of the senior scientists said, you know, the, problem, the real problem is, you know, how can I get money for my grant from the NIH? And, the other, and, they, and that was the whole discussion. <laughs> not for multiple, not for multi-scale thinking, but for funding their within-scale research, which, of course, remains a problem. Um, that was 10 years ago. Since then, um, slow, slow recognition of the importance of that problem ha has, been, has been made. But it's something that people doing EEG should also be aware of, that the brain does not run on EEG alone. And uh, uh, so ultimately, the field of brain electrophysiology will understand the relationships between different scales. We do know, uh, through fragmentary, not well-supported efforts by neurophysiologists, that the influences on changes in the, in the cortical fields dynamics, and the local field dynamics, are really multiple. So it's very com the idea is how is EEG modulated uh, is very complicated. There's the in inherent and tight links between excitatory and inhibitory scale cell networks that sustain, in particular, oscillatory, oscillatory behavior. <coughs> and the same is true for the cortical thalamic loops that have also been shown to be important for behavior and which are very uh, very thin uh, in, in spatial extent. There's sparse corticortical connections that, you know, that can be seen sparsely in terms of brain networks uh, with si where signals travel through uh, white matter tracks, which are, which are not, which are sparse. Each brain area is not connected to, each cortical area is not connected to a directly to all other cortical areas, only, only very few. Most of the connectivity in cortex is, is uh, very short range. It's neighbor to neighbor. And then what Edelman called the value system modulations, the uh, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and so on, that seem to give information about the significance, early information about the potential significance of an event to, the, uh, to factor into the cortical computation. Uh, these are known to 
uh, change the EEG spectrum or the, uh, the local field potential spectrum recorded in or on the cortex. My mentor, uh, Galambos, believed there were some tight, tighter links between neurons and glial dynamics than ever was imagined at that time when he wrote the paper and was uh, self-indicated at the end of his life 50 years later when uh, he was invited to the glial meeting and uh, he saw there was, there's, there's a huge field now of neural glial interactions. And then there's this recently discovered or rediscovered aphaptic, non-synaptic effects of field, external field activity on the internal dynamics of neurons. So all these influences are, are, are changing the, are affecting the EEG signals. Now I, I, I haven't, I've glossed over the main point, of course, of the, that this was used for teaching that the, uh, that the synchrony, in cortical synchrony across a patch of, of cortex is able to produce signals at the far field by its coordinated signals in the pyramidal cells that are uh, organized, that are that lie perpendicular to the surface of cortex. And because of their, of their um, structure, physical structure, they can produce a cascade of far field uh, potential and current that we can see as far away as the scalp. We don't see directly uh, the uh, potentials associated with the um, inhibitory cells because they have the, the stellate form that, has, uh, the, that the engineers call the closed field. So that their, their fields tend to cancel out at any distance. And therefore, the far field signals are dominated by uh, dipolar signals arising from synchronous activity across a field of pyramidal cells. Now, I use the word dipole. Dipole is the concept of dipole is, sim is simply a, a tiny or infinitesimal oriented battery that would produce this equivalent field to a, a structure. Uh, actually, the um, the dipoles in the cortex are, are, uh, are not infinitesimal in size. They, they have a source in sinks that are sources in sinks that are in different layers of cortex, which can be measured invasively. And here they were actually. This was uh, needles put into human cortex, 17 uh, channel needles, a needle was put into cortex, uh, cortex that was going to be removed by the surgeon. and. Uh, so these are the layers of cortex, one to six. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, plot uh, Holgren et al. put out uh, last year, um, where the well, x-axis represents latency following an event that occurred at time zero. This was a human subject, and it was, a, it was a, some sort of a cognitive task. And the point of this was that, oh, and it's important to note that the cortical surface here is up and the thalamus is down. Okay. That, that, in many cases, that means the skull is up, right? But not in other cases. So if, if you're talking about cortex in the fold of the, uh, uh, in the fold of, uh, for instance, the cingulate uh, sulcus, then uh, the relationship to the, uh, between the cortical surface and the skull surface might be opposite or completely different. So here is a re polarity reversals occurring at discrete layers, layers one and four, in fact, in the uh, of cortex at about five, six hertz. So this is an up-close example of a theta rhythm in cortex at one spot in cortex, but showing that the effective dipole is has a dipole moment, a dipole uh, length that can be measured. And then his paper is a very interesting one. It, it talks about the difference between surface negativities, cortical surface negativities, and positivities. So the, uh, the phase, uh, as we saw in the earlier picture there, the phase, uh, the blue phase, uh, blue phases, where the layer one is negative, 
relatively, relative to layer 4, um, he, he argues is ideal for acquiring information from uh, thalamus and lower cortical layers, whereas a surface positive phase is, should be ideal because it's in a different layer of cortex with different inputs, to be ideal for uh, interpreting information. Uh, because it gets input from local cortex in higher cortical areas instead of lower thalamus and sensory areas. So this suggests, he's, he's saying that this result suggests that there's an alternation in the kind of the computational, uh, computational uh, significance of what cortex is doing and that the theta rhythm in this case can uh, maybe a, a way that the brain uh, balances its, its its jobs, quote unquote, to listen and to um, integrate information. But for, I think, for EEG people, it, it means that surface negative and surface positives are not, are not uh, symmetrical. They, they, they have separate and distinct meanings. And this, this, this idea was uh, promoted, I think, about 1980 by uh, uh, researchers in Tübingen, and uh, it remains, I think, underappreciated by the field of EEG. However, it's the cortical surface we're talking about, not the skull, the skull surface. And so in terms of uh, sources, patches of cortex that are in the sulcus, sulci, uh, their, their projections are lateral and not toward the skull at all. So any projection to the skull and to the scalp surface may, be, may reflect surf, cortical surface or, or the opposite. So there's that problem. Okay, so is this how EEG propagates? Um, no. Here's a cartoon about how EEG propagates, and of course, anyone with physics training can see some problems. In my cartoon, uh, the field lines don't go out into the air, which is, of course, not conductive. So maybe imagine he's under salt water, the subject or something. Um, but the point of this picture is that any local synchrony is going to give these far field potentials that will be recorded by all the electrodes. So here are, here are this imagination of two such patches, uh, size and not realist, not to scale. And, uh, and the electrodes record the sum, the instantaneous sum, of all the potentials that arrive at them through volume conduction. This is why EEG uh, is derided by many still as a very fuzzy brain imaging modality because the channel signals themselves do receive input from all over the brain to varying strengths. And here is, a, that was a cartoon, here is a, an accurate electrophysiological model produced by uh, Zeynep Kalanachar using her NST toolbox from an MR image of an individual subject. Uh, and, it, and it projects, it shows how cortical potential project to the, to the scalp. So here is an imagined patch of synchronous uh, activity. Uh, in our pictures, we have blue is negative, red is positive, green is zero. And here is its projection to the scalp by simple biophysics and taking into account the conductivities of the different tissues it passes, passes through. Um, so that has uh, except for a, some sort of equator line that's sort of parallel to the plane of the patch, um, it projects to all the electro channels. And that means that um, electrode channel also al always has two ends, right? It's always a potential difference between two electrodes or two or more electrodes. So you, you can imagine where you could put the two electrodes and you would get a difference or get no difference. So uh, an EEG channel is uh, always 
uh, a spatial filter. It's a, like an antenna on your old TVs where you aim it. But do you remember it? Does anyone remember antenna and aiming thing? <laughs> okay, so this is the story that, that each electrode records almost all the sources in the brain, plus the non-brain sources. So I asked Zainab to, um, to make a million independent sources. Imagine each mini column in the cortex was doing its own thing with an EEG-like waveform. Uh, but then uh, to imagine that in one patch, these, these started coming together. They didn't get bigger. Their activity didn't get bigger. But they just, instead of being uh, uh, incoherent, they became coherent. And what would be the effects on the EEG? So here we go. And you see there's very little EEG that projects through a million random because of phase cancellation. But then when it becomes coherent, then the EEG is dominated by that. So EEG, I argue, is dominated by these islands of local synchronous. Now, here's a picture. Um, this is a simulation of, of EEG, of, uh, you know, fragment, uh, fragment of EEG. Now imagine what, are, what, is this, what, are, what, what is the cortical distribution that's producing that. What we see in the picture is things swirling over the head, and we see things going to the front of the head, and mainly in the back, and, and left and right. And uh, so there seems to be, oh, well, you can imagine, you know, one can imagine all sorts of things going on in the cortex that would produce that. However, this is what actually produces that. Two patches of cortex alternating <laughs> uh, 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 with a 10 hertz and a 9 hertz uh, rhythm, but completely static. And they produce all that moving, all those moving waves of activity. Well, it, it's actually uh, quite the exact equivalent of a moiré pattern. Have you seen those? So, um, you look in the dictionary, epiphenomenon means something that you see that doesn't actually causally influence anything. It's produced by other things that you don't see. And so these are, they, these are actually um, those impressions we had of moving waves and so on. It was, in this case, complete epiphenomena. The real phenomena, the only real phenomena, uh, the causal phenomena, were the actual uh, activity. Now, that doesn't mean that, that there's no moving waves in cortex. Uh, sleep spindles, for instance, are, and flow waves in sleep are, are seen to wander. And these movies don't work, uh, thanks to, uh, uh, it shows the real EEG with 30 sources, or with all the sources of EEG. And you imagine the complexity of, of that movie. It's actually hard to look at, even, when, even though it's slowed down five times. Now, Arno, I'm going to go over. Maybe Arno's here. Yeah, I'm going to go over, and, and then I'll take it out of the, we'll, we'll catch up in my mm -hmm. next talk. So um, if nowadays, if you get an MR image, head image, structural head image, you can find the different tissues. You can segment them. If you have an idea if, or put in ideas of what their conductivities are, uh, then you can make an electrical head model to solve the so-called forward problem, uh, which is, given that the potentials arise someplace on cortex, how should those appear on the scalp? That's the forward problem. And here is a boundary element model, uh, the outer layer of it, that. Uh, then it made from an MR image for a new visual subject. And then given EEG or, or magnetic EEG, MEG signals with the right kind of co-registration to the model of the sensors and uh, the right kind of signal processing, one can possibly come up with an inverse problem. And if it's a simple map representing the projection of one patch of cortex to the scalp, then you can actually not only find its equivalent location in the brain, but you can actually estimate, uh, if you have a high-resolution picture of the individual's cortex, you can estimate 
the location, size, orientation, and so on of that path. So this is high resolution EEG imaging. But of course, the problem is how to find the simple map that represents a single source, because of course EEG looks like this, and it's the sum of many sources, right? So wh wh how to find a moment, you know, which there's only one source, everything else is zero. Uh, well, that's sort of a vain hope, I think. But so you have to uh, try a different probe. And this was the uh, independent component analysis that I came across in in the form of a paper by Tony Bell and Sarsinovsky in uh, '95, 21 years ago. And they talked about the cocktail party. So here you have cocktail party uh, problem of, uh, of microphones recording multiple sound sources, the sum of them. So each microphone was recording cocktail party noise. In this case, two sound sources, two microphones. And some French mathematicians uh, began to realize in, um, that under certain plausible circumstances, one could actually unmix this problem. They, the signals were mixed in the microphone. So you could actually unmix the problems and you, without knowing what the sound sources were, so blind to whatever the nature of the sounds were, you could recover and separate the two sounds. And I read that paper, uh, Tony Bell, by Tony Bell, very nice paper, and uh, one night, and I, when I got the preprint, and uh, uh, I thought, well, here we have sources. We have uh, linear summation at microphones, no, at, uh, at electrodes. So perhaps the ICA would be able to find the time signatures of the sources and their individual projections to the scalp, which would help solve the inverse problem of finding their location. <clears throat> so with the next morning at 8 a.m., we started in. And a week later, we had a deadline to fill. So we, we submitted a short paper to NIPS, Neural Information Processing Systems meeting. And this was the first EEG, uh, ICA for EEG paper, whose claims, based on only one example, a crude example, uh, it turned out to hold up. I was very happy to read. I read the paper, and I thought, things we saw that first week are remain true, which is you know very gratifying for scientists. Right? And I'll, I'll just finish with showing an example of, of how, how that works in practice. Here are nine out of 100 channels that we analyzed, and 15 seconds out of a half hour of continuous uh, performance data. This is a continu continuous performance task, it's a two-back task with feedback. So the subject saw a letter, had to press a button, and then got a beep or a buzz and then waited a few hundred milliseconds, and it was a very hard test. And you see at the top, you know, it recorded the behavior on every trial, whether it's right or wrong or so on. Here are nine out of the hundred uh, independent component processes that were uh, learned by the ICA decomposition. And so you see what independence means here. The independence is uh, independence technically means, in this case, that knowing the values at, at instant t, knowing the values of any of those component processes, can't tell you anything about the value of the other component processes. Right? So it's given time t exactly here, and you see a positivity here, let's say, that will not predict statistically anything about any of these other signals because they're all functionally distinct as well as temporally in this case. And in fact, you can see that this is the ECG, which contributes to all the scalp electrodes and is pulled out by ICA here. Here's a, a, a spike, and you can see it in, in this case in the posterior channel a little bit, in the anterior channel not, but ICA finds it extremely well represented. Um, here is a posterior muscle, and it's sp occasional spiking in this experiment. Here is uh, more than one component that that accounts for the large projections into the data of the of blinks produced by blinks. Uh, perhaps slow blinks because the, the one precedes the other a little bit, and we'll talk about more about that later. Here is a frontal midline theta phenomena, 
But now you can see it's, it's, it, the signal's noise is very good. You can see it's waxing and waning in different trials. And in fact, if you look to a, a spectrogram map, you find there's another frequency there, 15 hertz. So the, 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 the frontal midline theta, which is localized to dorsal anterior cingulate, alternates between different frequencies. So you now have a lot of frequency resolution and time resolution to look at trial by trial changes in dynamics, depending on the context and so on. Here's another uh, right frontal theta burst that is independent over time of the other. And here is an interesting bilateral alpha phenomenon. So after every blink, there was a few hundred milliseconds of rest. And this is the lateral occipital cortex. And uh, it went into alpha mode. The alpha, it was flooded by alpha until the next stimulus came on, which, re which would be interpreted as reduction of attention by that particular brain subsystem. Local uh, lo lateral occipital cortex is associated with object identification. And in fact, they were trying to identify letters and remember whether they'd seen them two trials back. So you can get very specific information. Um, here, here is a close-up of that, showing the trial-to-trial -trial differences. And below it, we put the ERP for this, for this cortical process obtained by averaging all 1,000 trials. And I just repeated it. So here's the information. That's the information you can get from the ERP. At the cortical level, that's good. But what, you, what you'd be missing if you just studied the ERP would be all this temporal variability, all these interesting dynamics that is, that is associated in some interesting part with the context in which the subject is operating. So we don't have time for questions since I went, I got started slowly. I hope not too slowly for you. Um, part two will be in, a, in an hour from now. Um, I will, well, Okay, so uh, John, are you going to say something about the uh, birds of a feather dinners? Come do that. <laughs>